Welcome to our study on the parables 2001. It just seems like there's that many parables, doesn't it? It's been a lot of, been a long series, but a good one. So we're going to start again today in Luke 16, verses 1 through 15. Luke 16, verses 1 through 15. And he was also saying to, to the disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager. This manager was poor to him and squandering his possessions called him and said to him, What is this I hear about you? Give an accounting of your management, for you can no longer be manager. The manager said to himself, What shall I do since my master is taking management away from me? I, I am not strong enough to dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I know why what I shall do so that when I am removed from the management, people will welcome me into their homes. He summoned each one of the master's debtors and began saying to the first, how much do you owe my master? He said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write fifty. And he said to another, how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. He said to him, take your bill and write eighty. And his master praised the unrighteous manager because he had acted shrewdly. For the sons of this age are more shrewd in relation to their own kind than the sons of light. I say, you make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteousness so that when filled, they will see you to the eternal dwell. He is faithful in very little thing, and is faithful also in much, and he is unrighteous in very little thing, is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, who will entrust the true riches to you? If you have not been faithful in the use of that which is another, who will give you that which is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one, and love the other, or else he'd be devoted to one, despise the other. He cannot serve God and well. Now Pharisees, who were lovers of money, were listening to all these things, and were scoffing at him. He said to them, You are those who justify yourselves in the sight of men. But God knows your hearts. For that which is highly esteemed among men is detestable in the sight of God. Father, there are those listening now who need to hear what you have to say to them. I pray that their hearts will receive it. They will not argue with you, but they will be in compliance with your will. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We are at a time in Jesus' ministry where he's continuing to deal with many of the wrong attitudes of the Pharisees. Their hypocrisy, where they would say one thing and do another on purpose. Their covetedness, where they want, always want more than they had when what someone else had. Their love for importance. They thought they were the big cheese, that they were the most important thing to come along to slice bread. Their concept of God, which was totally erroneous, and their refusal to repent. They saw no need to change their lives at all. Now, he deals with their wrong attitude toward money. The purpose of this is twofold to rebuke the Pharisees and to instruct his disciples. To rebuke the Pharisees and to instruct his disciples. See, the Pharisees were characterized as lovers of money. Wealth for them was the highest good in life. Deuteronomy 28, God promised material blessings to those who obeyed the law. So they concluded that all wealth was a sign of divine approval in their lives. So they devoted themselves to acquiring what they considered the evidence of their acceptance to God. And you never had to wonder they had much. They went through all kinds of antics to let people know they had much. For example, in the temple, they set up these gold trumpets, and trumpet-shaped things where they put their money into the depository. This is the story where Jesus told the widow of the mite, where she put in all that she had, which made hardly no sound at all. But they would put their money into that temple offering, go round and round and round the trumpet, and it just would make all kinds of noise. Everybody knows that they'd give them a large amount. Here in the story, you see that it was customary for a wealthy man to turn and trust the oversight of his goods to a trusted manager. He didn't want to mess with it. This man trusted his wealth to his manager and made no effort to check on the administration for the good. The manager mismanaged the funds. Sooner or later, you all get caught, don't you? The owner heard the rumor and accusation that he fired the manager, which was the manager's lucky he didn't do more than they could have had his life for it. And so the manager was left with two, three options. One, he could take a menial job, he concluded that he was not physically able to do that. Second, he could beg that it's too humiliating. Funny how even in our greatest trouble that we'll hold on to our pride. 
or he could exercise his authority when people over instead of being concerned with the good of his master. He was selfish and considered only his good. When all of this is said and done, the owner praised him, not because he cheated and robbed him, but because he acted shrewdly. And Christ is saying that his disciples should use sound principles of their time and wealth, not for the present, but for the future. Verse 9, he said, I say you make friends for yourselves by means of the wealth of unrighteousness. So that will fail they will receive you to eternal dwellings. He sums up the application for us as followers. Use material things which are of secondary importance to your spiritual advantage, which is of primary importance. Use material things for spiritual advantage, or as Jesus said in Matthew 6 20, not lay it for yourselves treasure lay it for yourselves treasure in heaven. Not treasured on earth, where people can take them away from you, and they can rust and rot and all of that. The idea that we're to be faithful in what is entrusted to us. That's the whole idea of this parable. Be faithful in what is entrusted to us. And there are three vital principles for Christian living and effectiveness. First one is little becomes much. Little becomes much. It said there that when you're faithful in little, you will be given much. If you're faithful, if you're not very, if you're unfaithful in very little things, you'll also be unfaithful in much. So many speak, people speak of doing great things, but are not willing to do the little things. The great things are built on the little things. Great things are built on little things. It's kind of a stepping stone to idea. This is not how much you have, but how much you do with what you have. God will not entrust more to you if you're not faithful in what you already have. Those who are faithful, more will be given. Now we're talking about, I'm not talking about talking, talking about manipulating God to become rich. It is about responsibility. You are responsible for what God gives you. What gives you, God gives you should be used to be, bring glory to Him. It should be used to help you grow in Christ and should be used to bring others to Christ. None of that takes place without being faithful and responsible with what God gives you. See, it's not for you to decide if it matters or not, if it's small or big. We make too many decisions on what matters and doesn't matter instead of just doing what God gives us to do. Let me say it again. We make too many decisions on what matters and doesn't matter instead of just doing what God gives us to do. For instance, you get up on Sunday morning and think, well, I don't, go with, I don't know if I want to go with that. It doesn't really matter if I'm there or not, does it? But yeah, it does. It, it matters to somebody somewhere who's watching your life and paying attention to your witness. It does matter. We make too many decisions based on what does matter and what doesn't matter. Just do what God gives us to do. When we are faithful to what God has entrusted us, there are no unimportant tasks, there are no little assignments, there are no wasted opportunities. Generations are built upon one act of obedience. It's amazing to us. Generations are built upon one act of obedience. Generations fall over one act of disobedience. Let me ask you some questions. Do you want to experience more of Jesus? Do you want to be effective in serving Him? Uh, you can be. You can be and you ought to be. You want to make a difference in your family and community? And be faithful and responsible with each and everything God gives you to do. He will give you more. The more you respond, the more God gives you. The less you respond, the less God reveals to you. Then He'll give you more. He'll give you more. He'll give you more. It works both ways. If you're faithful in little, you'll be faithful in much. It builds. It also deteriorates. Because if you're unfaithful in little, you will be unfaithful in much. We tend to think of our little resources don't matter. We tend to think our money that we give doesn't matter. You never know where it goes. We tend to think our talent doesn't matter. But you never know what God can do with it. They matter much. I shared this with you last week. Every hell wrote these words, I'm only one, but I am one. I cannot do everything, but I can do something. I will not love what I cannot do and fear with what I can do. Jesus simply asks one thing of us, one thing, to be faithful and do what we can with what we have. All in my time where Jesus fed the 5,000 from two fish and five loaves of bread. That's all a little boy had, and that's all anybody had. Two loaves of bread and five fish. Five loaves of bread and two fish, I'm sorry. What much was it until it's placed in the hands of Jesus? When you place your life in the hands of Jesus, there's a lot he can do with it. More than you could ever imagine. 
the second principle of Christian living is no one can serve two masters. He said that right there in the red wall go. He said no no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. You cannot be faithful until you show who your master is. It's impossible to serve two masters. Sometimes someone's going to master you. Now, how do you know your master about what determines your decision? Those are aware of a need, you also know that Jesus wants you to meet that need. You're also concerned it will put a strain on your budget. Instead of obeying and trusting him, you play it safe and keep it for yourself. Of course, later on when you want something, you easily spend it on what you want. But that means that money is your master. It is. And that's just an example. But the real issue is an issue of the heart. There isn't room for two masters in your heart. It's too crowded in there and crowded heart. Crowded hearts lead to compromise and compromise leads to ineffective disobedient Christian living. Who or what do you listen to? Who or what has your attention? What is the foundation for each and every decision you make? And the third principle we have is, what man values is detestable in God's sight? And we live a noticed life. What I mean by that is, you cannot escape what God knows. St. Chronicles, Chronicles 69 says, for the eyes of the Lord move to and fro throughout the earth that he may so strongly support those whose heart is completely hid. Psalm 34, 15 says, The eyes of the Lord are toward the righteous, and his ears are open to their cry. Proverbs 5, 2 says, For the ways of men are before the eyes of the Lord, and he watches over all his paths. Proverbs 15, 3 says, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, watching the evil and the good. God knows your heart. He's paying attention to what you value. The question is, are you paying attention? The test was a strong word. It refers to complete and total disgust. You cannot value the things of man and things of God at the same time. No room in your heart for both of them. It is essential and imperative that we value what Jesus values. It's essential that we are in the process of becoming like him. It's imperative that he's to be the priority and love of our lives. We have a choice. Pharisees, they love money, so they scoff at this principle. They scoff at being faithful. This is the most difficult parable yet to understand, but it's also the most penetrating in application. It's the basic thing. Think eternal things. Pursue eternal things. Do eternal things. All for the kingdom of God. Nothing for yourself. All for the kingdom of God. The question is, are you faithful to what God's given to you? What God wants you to do? doesn't matter if you like it or not. Are you faithful? Will you do it? Because God's not going to tell you anything else, you know. He said, well, I wish God, I've got an important scene, man. I wish God would reveal that, what he wants me to do. And God's up there saying, hey, hold on. I've already told you what to do on the other thing. You haven't done it. So why should I trust you with more? If you want God, if you want to trust God, you want God to trust you with his wisdom, his insight, and his blessing, then you're going to have to be faithful to each time you obey, God reveals more to you. It's a wonderful, wonderful principle. Each time you obey, God reveals more to you. If you have much that you can experience with God, it will just be faithful to Him. We're going to be shrewd in our dealing with mankind and people. We're going to be wise, not foolish, but wise. Do it for His glory. Be faithful and love so that you can be faithful and much. And God will give you much. He'll give you more to do. God bless you for listening today.